A guy named Reza found a brand new USB drive still in its package, lying in the parking lot of his place of work. He picked it up, thinking he could always use an extra thumb drive. The next day, when he came back to work, he inserted it into his computer and used it as he would any other thumb drive. Unbeknownst to him, that thumb drive was placed in the parking lot by foreign agents and contained one of the most sophisticated and powerful computer worms ever produced. In fact, it was the world's first known cyber weapon. That tiny $20 drive was able to do something that otherwise would have required perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars worth of weapons, hundreds of lost lives, and possibly could have triggered a major regional war. The year was around 2008, and the parking lot was in a nuclear enrichment research facility in an undisclosed location in Iran. This particular malware was designed in such a way that it stayed dormant, mostly. It made such subtle changes over such a long period of time that no one noticed it for years. It was designed specifically to target PLCs, that is, programmable logic controllers. These are industrial computers that control industrial processes. And the industrial process in this particular facility were centrifuges that were key to enriching uranium for creating a nuclear bomb. This malicious malware is now known as Stuxnet, and it wreaked havoc on Iran's nuclear bomb program, setting it back multiple years. How did this worm work? What did it do? Why was it so hard to detect? And how was it finally revealed? The answer to these questions will take us on a fascinating international journey, and a journey inside your computer. Stay tuned because that's coming up right now. I want to clarify that the picture I just painted about how the USB drive was transferred to the Iranian nuclear facility is speculative. No one knows exactly how or when it was transferred, but the scenario I outlined has been suggested by some people who have analyzed this worm. It's widely accepted that the Stuxnet worm was a cyber weapon designed by the US and Israeli intelligence specifically to target Iran's top secret uranium processing facilities. But Iran had gone to great lengths to ensure security. For example, the facility's computers were not physically connected to any computer outside the facility. This is called an air gap. So there was seemingly no way to infiltrate these computers remotely via any kind of internet or extranet. But thanks probably to an individual who unknowingly used an infected device like a USB drive, not only was the nuclear facility affected, but the worm also eventually and unexpectedly spread to outside computers. Stuxnet exploited at least four previously unknown Windows vulnerabilities. These are called zero-day vulnerabilities. They are security flaws for which the vendor has not yet made a patch. Stuxnet was first identified by the InfoSec community in 2010, but it's estimated the development on it probably began in 2005 under the George W. Bush administration and was continued under the Barack Obama administration. These administrations believed that if Iran were to develop atomic weapons, Israel would launch airstrikes against them, which could trigger a major regional conflict and destabilize the region. Developing and unleashing a cyber warfare software weapon was seen as a non-violent alternative, and so it was given the go-ahead under George W. Bush. The program was labeled Operation Olympic Games. Stuxnet was the result. It was designed to destroy the centrifuges that Iran was using to enrich uranium for its nuclear bomb program. Why is enrichment needed? That's because mined uranium comes mainly in the form of uranium-238. But uranium-238 is not fissile, meaning that it cannot be used in a fission reaction. Only a small fraction of the mined material about 0.7% is its isotope U-235, which is fissile, but it needs to be enriched to a higher concentration to about 90% U-235 in order to be used in a nuclear weapon. A centrifuge is used to spin uranium fast enough to separate the lighter U-235 isotope from U-238. The nature of these centrifuges is such that they tend to have a short lifetime. They get damaged in normal operation. The way Stuxnet worked once it infected a computer is it checked to see if that computer was connected to any PLCs manufactured by Siemens Corporation, which is the type of PLC used by the Iranians. 
These PLCs are how computers interacted with and controlled the uranium centrifuges. Stuxnet was written in such a way that even after it detected the Siemens PLCs, it remained dormant for a significant period of time in order to ensure maximal spread without detection and learn the patterns of normal operations. Once activated though, Stuxnet subtly altered the PLC's programming, which caused the centrifuges to spin irregularly, damaging or destroying them more often in the process. And even more brilliantly, while this malfunction was happening, the worm used a vulnerability in the Siemens software to change the PLC's programming so that it would tell all the controlling computers that nothing was wrong, that everything was working as normal. So it infected both the computer software and the control software running the PLCs. The result was that while under normal conditions, about 800 centrifuges per year would be expected to fail, in this case, at least 2,000 centrifuges per year were starting to fail. This number should be fairly accurate because it was reported by inspectors in the IAEA, or the International Atomic Energy Commission. Because of the way the worm was designed to subtly affect the PLCs, it's believed that it went undetected for years because it was difficult, if not impossible, for Iranian engineers to detect or diagnose the problem with the failing centrifuges. It's estimated that this resulted in setting the Iranian nuclear program back by at least two years. So this is how Stuxnet worked. But now the question is, if it's so difficult to detect, how was it eventually discovered? Well, it was discovered only after it unexpectedly spread beyond the air gap of the Iranian nuclear facility. No one knows exactly how it got out. It could be that someone in the facility with sloppy security practices could have taken a work laptop home and connected it to the internet. If this were to happen, the worm would spread pretty fast because it's designed to be an extremely aggressive malware. It was first brought to the attention of security personnel by a call to a tech center. It turned out that an office in Iran, which by the way, had no connection to the nuclear processing facility, was experiencing blue screens and automatic reboots on their computers. Their tech support person was not able to figure out what was happening, so he contacted a friend in Belarus who happened to work for an antivirus vendor. That friend engaged other colleagues at his company who were able to identify and isolate the malware. They soon realized how sophisticated it was by looking at how many operating system vulnerabilities or zero days it was exploiting. Most malware exploits a single vulnerability. This one was exploiting at least four. These Belarusians then shared what they had discovered with the rest of the global security community. Symantec reported that it was the most complex malware code they had ever looked at and that it was in a quote, different league compared to everything else they had ever seen. Kaspersky Lab estimates that it took a team of at least 10 developers three years to develop the worm. If true, this would put the start date of the attack around 2008, since work was believed to have started in 2005. And this would fit with the reports of the damage being in 2009 and continuing into 2010 before getting detected. Neither the U.S. nor Israel have officially admitted to creating Stuxnet, and none of its developers have ever come forward. The original code was never released, but reverse engineering revealed that it looked for arrays of 168 frequency converters. Why this number? Well, it turns out that the IAEA has online documentation specifying exactly what you would see in a uranium enrichment facility. And this documentation says, you guessed it, that there would be 168 centrifuges arranged in each array. That's exactly what the code was designed to detect. This is how the security company realized that they were probably looking at a government-sponsored cyber weapon. The interesting thing is that Stuxnet has likely not completely vanished. It's so difficult to detect that it is still out there, but it does not pose a threat. It was designed to do one thing, and that is to destroy or delay the Iranian nuclear program. And in this, it was arguably quite effective. Any bad effect that it had on civilian computers was purely collateral damage. The story of Stuxnet is important for us to remember because it was the first known time that a set of computer codes was used for the purpose of international conflict, 
Prior to Stuxnet, this kind of thing was thought to be sci-fi. We are used to thinking that malware infections on our computers affect data only. So the worst thing that can happen is that our data will be stolen or erased, or that our computers will get a blue screen or ransomware pop-up. But Stuxnet showed for the first time that malware can actually affect the physical world. In this case, it was destroying centrifuges, but subsequent cyber attacks have targeted other types of machines. For example, Indestroyer, developed by Russia-sponsored hackers, targeted industrial control systems and disrupted the Ukrainian power grid in 2016. Indestroyer was actually discovered by our sponsor, ESET. More about them in a minute. Stuxnet showed that almost nothing is off limits to hackers, intent on malice. For example, any kind of IoT device, such as smart refrigerators, toasters, thermostats, TVs, all are or will be susceptible to attacks. Stuxnet demonstrated that even air gaps are not enough to keep hackers out. For example, it is not unreasonable to imagine that hackers could sabotage just about any kind of production line or industrial machinery, such as oil refineries, water purification plants, electricity production, pharmaceutical manufacturing, you name it. Essentially, anything controlled by PLCs could be affected. Furthermore, many devices are programmed but monitored by some kind of computer and updated remotely. Examples would be some hospital equipment and cars like Tesla. A hacker could conceivably take over and put such devices under the control of a malicious entity. Imagine someone taking over your IV drug dosage remotely while you're in the hospital or remotely driving your car ultimate cyber terrorism. Now, this is not intended to be alarmist, but to make you aware of what's possible. How can you prevent this from affecting your life? Probably the best thing you can do is stick with a robust antivirus software, such as the one offered by our sponsor, ESET, Internet Security. They're one of the biggest privately held global security companies. Staying privately owned allows them to maintain their independence and focus on their main goal of providing uncompromising digital protection for homes and businesses. There are a couple of things that make ESET stand apart from their competition. First, their cybersecurity software, it's much lighter on your computer resources. So it's especially great if you have an older computer or need every bit of your computing power. ESET software can run in the background with virtually no slowing of your computer. Second, ESET focuses on preventing cyber attacks before they happen, even by threats yet unknown. They do this by employing powerful security layers, combining both human expertise and artificial intelligence that has been trained on data sets collected over decades. This allows them, and subsequently you, to stay one step ahead of the attackers. Click the link in the description to get started with ESET today. You can try their home products for free, or if you want to protect your business, you can request a demo of their business solutions. You'll be glad you did. And as champions of science education, ESET are sponsoring the Starmus International Festival taking place in Bratislava, Slovakia on May 12th to the 17th this year. Starmus is an international gathering celebrating astronomy, space exploration, and natural science. They'll be featuring talks by scientists such as Jane Goodall and Kip Thorne. If you live in or are visiting Slovakia, this is a must-see event. Now, if you have any comments or questions about ESET or anything you saw in this video, I'd love to hear from you. So please put these in the comment section. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.